Okay, so um, so Dr. Morton here in uh, doing uh, the lecture for um, digital systems design for the uh, 18th. Uh, and I'm going to review for the final exam today. Uh, hopefully you're all working on your final projects and getting them knocked out. I am uh, grading the, the practicums. Uh, it's taken me a while to get that done. I've just been... Uh, it's, it's it's been difficult it's just been a lot of work getting uh you know recording 10 videos a week going in um four days a week for laboratories um it's kind of the worst of both worlds uh recording the videos takes time and it's hard to do it's not the same as doing a lecture and um anyway not so bad for the digital systems design but it's a whole lot harder for micro one and for and uh Anyway, and there's just been lots and lots and lots of email traffic. Uh, lots of students that are just not doing, uh, staying up with the work. And so I'm, I'm having to either, you know, choose a, choose a very difficult situation where, you know, they're not going to do well or I'm going to give them another chance. But then that just really multiplies the work. So um, anyway, so I, I don't know. It's been it's been hard. But uh, it's almost over, and that's the good thing, I guess. But the bad news is it looks like we're lining up for a repeat next semester. So we'll see. All right, so here's our syllabus. Um, so we are on the 18th, and we've already covered all this. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to do um, 11C and D. I might, uh, and I might not. Uh, but in any event, um, we're cruising along here so next week we'll we'll uh so we'll, i may not do a lecture this friday next week we'll have monday and wednesday and then we'll have uh one more um we'll have two more days a monday and a wednesday i think that's how that works out the 30th and the second after thanksgiving and of course the 27th is thanksgiving so um so we'll probably we probably will not have class, uh, any lecture for friday um and that should do it so make sure, make sure you're doing the, you're looking at the videos and doing the quizzes. Make sure you you turned in all your homework. Um, uh, it may be too late now anyway. Uh, make sure you, d but make sure you do have all your labs. The last day to make up your labs is the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. That's a week from today. So you've got a week. Uh, there, these labs are pretty straightforward. There's lots of helper code available for you. There's no excuse for not doing these labs, and if you miss two labs, you're not getting the grade. You're getting it incomplete. You're going to have to complete it sometime in January before uh, a year is up. So make sure you're doing the labs. You must demo the lab to the TA, or you must do a video and send it to the TA. Um, also, make sure you turn in the uh, the, the turn-in sheets. Uh, those those You'll get a grade, but those are going to cost you maybe 5% of each lab uh, if you don't turn those in. So turn those in. Uh, apparently there are quite a few students that have done the labs but haven't turned in the turned in the sheets. And there are also quite a few students that haven't done all the labs. So make sure you get them done. Remember, you, you don't have to do um, the, SDK, the SDK labs. You just have to turn in the sheet. I'd like you to try them, at least take a shot at them. And remember, if you don't have the board files uh, loaded up on your desktop, then you then they then the SDK labs will not run. So you so you can come into the labs and do them there. They are located. They are loaded up on those computers, and it's easy to load them on yours. It just takes a little digging. You have to go to the Digilent Inc. website and find the board file for the Nexus 4 board, and then get it put in the right directory in Vivado, and then everything's fine. Uh, and there's instructions on how to do that uh, in the uh, on the Digilent site, and maybe even on the Vivado site as well. Um, or on the Xilinx site. Okay, so enough said with that. Let's get, go. I'm gonna. So I'm. I'm. I'm just gonna go through the exam. I can't remember what I put on the board. So um, yeah, uh, I was gonna. I. I did. Well, never mind. I'll cover that later. Maybe. Uh, all right. So uh, I'm not gonna show you the file. I'm just gonna go over it. So you're just gonna get to see me. Uh, and let me go ahead and bring up the file. So, um, so the uh, so um, 
so a lot of the questions are going to be um, a lot of the questions are going to be uh, 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 multiple choice, true, false. A lot of them may be true, false. That's kind of how it's set up right now. Okay, so anyway, um, so let me go through this. Okay, so uh, so first we'll talk about language-based hardware design tools. Number of advantages. So the gate level details for a large FPGA would really be overwhelming, and that's why we use it in hardware description language. True. Yeah, the, the, the details are just, uh, I mean, it would just be really difficult to program an FPGA w without, um, without language-based tools. It would really be hard to do it. I, I don't even know how you could. Uh, Language-based tools allow for working at either behavior level or uh, register transfer level or gate trans or gate levels of abstraction. Yes, that's true. Language-based tools make it easier to integrate third-party IP into a design. Yes, that's absolutely true as well. Synthesizers are key to making the hardware description languages the way to design digital hardware. Yes, that's right. It's the synthesizers that where all the power resides. For the for the Xilinx chips, the synthesizer uh, is what allows you uh, to generate the bit file for that particular uh, 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 FPGA, and the synthesizer for, say, in in uh, in uh, Mentor Graphics or uh, 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 some of the other. Uh, let's see, the one we have here is uh, uh, um, let's see. So. Um, so yeah, so these hardware description languages, uh, these uh, integrated development environments, the big ones are um, Cadence, Synopsys, and Mentor Graphics. Those are the three big ones uh, that are used basically for designing integrated circuits. And all those companies do a bunch of other stuff as well. But, uh, but they all put out these big uh, development systems for that. Um, okay, the ability to simulate a design before it's turned into hardware saves costs. Yeah, a lot of costs. Uh, if you can get it so that your confidence is extremely high that right out of the box uh, you're going to make an integrated circuit that's going to work the first time, that's huge. And if you can't do that, that's going to be very expensive when you have to go through multiple spins in the foundry uh, at, a you know, maybe a, um, hundreds of thousands of dollars a spin, maybe half a million a spin. Um, <clears throat> So hardware, hardware description languages allow designers to focus more on the overall architecture instead of low-level details. Absolutely. New hardware description languages are not likely to appear in the next 10 years. No, they're, they're pretty likely to appear. Uh, we have System C, System Verilog coming on. Um, and uh, I, we'll just see a, probably a number of uh, other developments. Integrated development environments like Vivado contain uh, the following features. So the ability to use Tickle Script to control design flow. Yeah, uh, you remember the TCL script that you used in the very first lab? Hopefully you did that part of the lab. Uh, and the reason for this is this, uh, this allows you to script uh, large parts of what you want uh, Vivado to do. And it definitely, uh, definitely can sort of automate some of your tasks. Um, simulation can be done only after the synthesizer is completed. No, you can do pre-synthesis and post-synthesis simulation. And you should do that. You should simulate before you synthesize. You should simulate after you synthesize. You can see where the router and placer put your design on the FPGA. Yeah, you can, you, you, you can't, you have some visibility into that, but uh, not a lot. Syntax checking is a feature of the editor. Uh, yes, Vivado can generate all the photo masks to make an integrated circuit. No, Vivado generates bit files for Xilinx products. Uh, Xilinx isn't into making, well, I mean, they obviously make the ICs they sell, but they're not into design, to providing new tools to design integrated circuits. They're, 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 they're interested in providing new tools to program their FPGAs and CPLDs. Um, the following statements about hardware design uh, mark the ones that are in general true. The reusability of language-based designs has been key in developing very complex ICs, yes. Using uh, intellectual property uh, from other folks or even from the same company uh, has been critical 
in, uh, in going uh, to more and more complex chips. Uh, the hard, hardware description languages are first used to make ICs and later adopted also to do simulation. Nope, other way around. They were first actually developed to just document code, then when they were used to simulate it, and finally they were used to actually uh, uh, produce the, uh, the hardware. One of the keys to good design uh, is to break it into sub-modules uh, which are separate logical parts of the design. Yes, you always want to break your design down into, into, into reasonable uh, granularity of sub-modules. You don't want you know, an infinite number of little bitty modules, but you, want to have, uh, but you don't want to have functions or sub-modules that, that just do, that do huge amounts of the task. You'd, you'd like to have each one of them uh, sort of self-contained and, and, and segregated by sort of the logical functions. Verilog is one of the most useful HDLs in the U.S. for making ICs. Yeah, currently that's true. Um, there are a number of uh, HDLs, including Verilog, VHDL, System Verilog, System Verilog, System C, yes. In general, differences in writing good HDL code and C++ code, uh, what are the differences between those two? General differences between writing good HDL and good C code. So you should think in, in serial steps with C, and somewhat in parallel with HDLs. It's sort of true. Uh, obviously with HDLs we also have to think, uh, you know, we think of, uh, we, we, we might want to do a signal capture with uh, some real parallel circuitry, but we also might want to have a state machine that goes through in a logical sequence a number of states. Any legal HDL code that you can write can be synthesized. No, nope, that is not true. Uh, there are definite limits, especially when you're doing a bit file uh, you may exceed the capability of the chip, uh, just the capacity of the chip. You may write code that you can't synthesize even with a, a custom integrated circuit. Uh, you may not be able to, uh, you might have to, you, there may be issues with getting it initialized the way you want. There might be all sorts of problems. Uh, and you certainly can write code that that uh, that is that is not actually uh, logically uh, doable. Uh, there's a strong push to be able to write HDL code in something close to standard C++. Yeah, the, there is a strong push. The Verilog, uh, as you know, for, because you've been studying it now for a semester, you know it is it is arcane. The word arcane means it's got lots of details and it's hard to learn. Uh, and it's confusing. And it's definitely that, all that and worse. Um, so there is a push for, for going to these newer uh, languages. The progress in synthesizers has driven most of the advances in language-based design. Yeah, I think that's, that's generally true. Uh, if the synthesizers couldn't, uh, hadn't gotten better and better, uh, we'd still be having to get down to lower and lower levels of granularity and abstraction in order to, uh, in order to actually make a functioning chip. Uh, the progress in synthesizers, uh, the, yeah, I said that. The use of intellectual property can be a big saver in development time. Yes, absolutely. Um, so now we're going to talk about Verilog specifically. The following, refer to, uh, the following refer to Verilog use in hardware design and what is not synthesizable. Inertial delays are for simulation purposes only. Yes, they are not synthesizable. Propagation delays can be synthesized. Nope. They, they are also only for simulations. Wait for 10 nanoseconds in an always loop can be synthesized. Yes, it can be. Uh, but it might be difficult to get that done. But, but in theory, it, it is synthesizable. Uh, the display operator is not synthesizable. That's right, it's not. Uh, and that's because you don't have any... Uh, just because you write display doesn't mean that you've suddenly... Uh, graced your integrated circuit with some sort of display capability, uh, you would have to have specifically uh, written that in in, a, in probably several very complex modules, not to mention then external hardware, none of which could be directly synthesized by your integrated development environment. The display operator, uh, sorry, the, the division operator has some synthesizable limitations in Vivado. Yes, that's, that's absolutely true. Uh, uh, yeah. So there are hardware multipliers in Vivado. 
but division's much more complicated and probably takes a bunch of code. All right. Um, when uh, so uh, if you if you have a uh, a parameter for the width of a shift register uh, and uh, but it has a default width of say uh, eight bits, then when you instantiate it, do you have to specify the width, or can you just leave uh, uh, the parameter width uh, unspecified when you instantiate it? And what will happen? Well, if you don't specify it and you have a default or a defined value in in the uh, code, then it then it's going to uh, default to that that value. But if you do specify it, then it will override the default and and put in whatever value you instantiate it with. Um, so uh, shift registers that uh, concatenate uh, the extra bit on the uh, left end of, uh, of a vector that's, uh, that's the maximum value minus one down to zero would constitute a left shift or a right shift? And the answer is obviously it's a right shift. Uh, well, it may not be so obvious. Um, let's see. Um, when you have a parameter in a module, and you instantiate it uh, a couple of different times, you can specify a different size for the parameter every time you instantiate it. All right, um, let's see. Uh, yeah, all right. Um, so uh, the pins on the uh, FPGA that we're using are the uh, the the Artrix um, seven series one we're using uh, are connected with solder balls on the underside of the chip. Yes, that's right. The constraint file specifies whether a pin is an input or an output. No, the constraint file doesn't do that. the 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 module port list does that. Um, if we have an input pin. Uh, where we're using a push button on an input, and we 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 connect the uh, the push button is normally open, and we connect one end of the push button uh, to uh, VDD, and then the other end of the push button we connect to the input pin. Is this a sufficient hookup for the push button? What will it read when we don't push it? What will it read when we push it? Well, when we push it, it's going to read one because we're directly connected to uh, VDD. When we don't push it, it, we leave it floating. And in, when it floats, we're not sure how it's going to be read. Uh, if, we, if we approach it with our finger uh, or our hand, we might be able to induce electrical charge on it, uh, or we might be able to induce a negative charge such that it would definitely read zero, or we might even induce enough static that we might uh, 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 pop the uh, the some of the some of the uh, floating gates on our CMOS chips um, and actually destroy the chip. Um, so what we normally then we don't ever leave the gate floating, uh, the sorry the input floating. We always have to attach a, a pull up or a pull down resistor. Now if you connect the push button, a normally open push button connects the pin when it's pushed to VDD. But when it's not pushed, then it, it, it does it's not connected to VDD. What what how would you put in the the resistor? Would it be a pull up or a pull down to make it work correctly? Well, the answer is it would definitely be a pull down. You'd want it to be pulled down to ground when you don't push the button, and when you push the button, then you would want it to be uh, uh, sh basically shorted to VDD so that it would read high, um, and that would also avoid any floating uh, because when the push button's open, the resistor would pull it down to ground. Now you could switch that around. The push button could ground the pin and the resistor could pull it up to VDD so that it would read a one when the push button is not pushed and a zero when the push button is pushed. Um, so let's see. Um, uh, let's see. Um, so you need to p provide a stable power supply to the chip. Yes, you, 
yeah, these 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 FPGAs are pretty sensitive to big voltage fluctuations. There are a whole number of pins on the chip that have to be driven, both to VDD and then a number of them that have to be connected to ground. Um, there's uh, 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 sometimes the analog portions have to have separate power supplies, uh, but common ground so that they can uh, not be influenced by the switching noise that would be on the uh, on the uh, other power supply. Uh, you certainly have to have a number of capacitors for bypass uh, connected quite close to the chip. And usually you have uh, several different uh, value ranges so that you can uh, so that you can respond to different requirements. You want a fairly uh, big capacitor uh, that's going to handle uh, sudden current surges that, uh, that when you might switch many, many, many gates all at once. Uh, and then you might have uh, slightly lower value caps that, can, uh, that are much better at responding to short uh, spikes uh, in RF that might get into the, uh, that might get into the, to the power supply. Um, let's see. Um, to have a nice stable clock, we usually do use an external clock, um, and uh, that's that's typically generated by a, a crystal uh, a crystal clock chip. Um, so, on your on your board, uh, on your Xilinx, all the Xilinx chips use RAM, static RAM. To uh, to control uh, the to to write the bit to hold the bit file and to set all the all the hardware switches in the uh, FPGA uh, in in the correct mode to create the hardware that you've designed. That that uh, that bit file that goes into those RAM locations uh, has. Um, uh, is volatile. So when you power the chip down, the the data that's stored in the random a the static random access memory is lost. So you do have to have on the on the on the printed circuit board hosting your FPGA chip and whatever other chips you have. Uh, it has to be somewhat non-volatile. Uh, it, ha well, it has to be non-volatile, or you have to have an external source that's going to automatically program that chip on power up. There's a, a, a large number of ways you can power the chip on power up. I mean, sorry, that you can program the chip on power up. But you have to have a method for programming it when you power it up. And uh, that can be done by having an, an EEPROM on the board or a flash on the board. Or uh, it can be done by, um, by having a, a connection to a server that's going to automatically download the, uh, the code. Uh, to the uh, FPGA, but but there must be some way that you're going to provide that bit file, uh, and and since the RAM is non-volatile, I mean sorry, since the RAM is volatile, uh, you have to have some other method and some other way to uh, location to store that uh, that that bit file. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Um, So if we have uh, if we if we have a uh, if we have a uh, 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 a module that defines a uh, a flip flop, and within that module we have an always block uh, where the clock is is in the sensitivity list. If we have a clear, but the clear is not in the sensitivity list, then we would call that a asynchronous clear. I'm sorry, we would call that asynchronous clear. But if the clear is in the sensitivity list, then we would call it a asynchronous clear. And the reason for that is, if it's not in the sensitivity list, then it's only going to take effect on active clock edges. But if it's in the sensitivity list, then it can take effect when, regardless of whether the clock has just ticked or not. And remember that normally in the sensitivity list, we, ha we must have all edge signals. They can be a mixture of positive and negative edges, but they have to be all edge, or we have to have all level signals. And usually, when we have all level signals, what we're really shooting for is actually combinational logic and not a sequential design, uh, or not a sequential result. Um, 
Okay, let's see. Um, by propagation delay and uh, inertial delay, we basically mean the time it takes for the active elements uh, in a gate to transition, or in a flip-flop or whatever, to transition the output from uh, whatever it was to whatever it's going to and become stable at that new output level. So that can go from an output of zero to one or go, go from an output of one to zero. And sometimes those times are different whether it's rising or falling. And we call those, uh, we call that time propagation delay. Uh, we also have a thing we call transport delay, or uh, we also call that first item inertial delay or, or propagation delay. We also have a thing we call transport delay. Transport delay is just the, the travel time of uh, the electronic signals through at the speed of light through uh, paths uh, on the integrated circuit. Um, okay, so what you should remember is in simulations, spikes uh, that are shorter than a propagation delay or an inertial delay are not propagated, but spikes are propagated through whatever transport delay you might have. You can think of transport delay as just the time to go through a wire, but you can think of the inertial delay as the time for the, for the active elements of the circuit uh, making up a gate uh, to actually respond and generate the correct output. And if that's not, if that's interrupted before that process is completed, then the output may never reach uh, that targeted new value. So like if it was going to go to zero to one and you only let it go, say it, say it normally takes it uh, five nanoseconds to do that and you only left, uh, you, you, you uh, canceled your changes after say, one or two nanoseconds, the output may never have started to go up noticeably, and so it, you may see absolutely no glitch at all. Uh, but in the propagation, in the transport delay, you would see that. In the propagation or inertial delay, you would not see it. Um, okay, um, I think those are that's a good whack at kind of uh, uh, some of the stuff that you might see on the test. Um, and I probably won't ask you to write a lot of code, but I may I may have some short code snippets that I'll ask you questions about. Um, make sure you review the operators, uh, at least the ones we've used. Um, yeah, make sure you know uh, how wires and registers are used. Make sure you know that in a, in, an assign, in a continuous assignment statement, the left-hand side must be a net or a wire. Make sure you know that in a, um, uh, in, in, a, in a, the left side in an always block that the variable has to be a register. The right side can be whatever you want. Uh, that's true in an always block and that's true in combinational logic. But the left side in a combinational logic must be a wire, and in an always block, which is essentially a sequential environment, must be uh, a, uh, a register. Okay. Well, I think that pretty much covers it. Uh, like I said, we won't have a lecture, or I won't do a recording for Friday, um, and then I will do some more review next week. I might cover a few more topics. There's maybe a couple things I might want to point out, but I won't test you on those. Uh, at least I'm not intending to at this point. And the test will be similar to what I just went through. Uh, there'll be probably 100 questions or something close to it. Uh, make sure you do review um, just uh, the basics of, of how our integrated development environment uh, works through a simple project, this, the steps of synthesis, um, and, and uh, just make sure you're you're familiar with kind of the things we did in the labs. I won't really ask you anything more complicated than, than what we did in labs. All right, I think I'll stop the recording with that and we will um, then uh, we'll um, touch base, not this Friday, but Monday and Wednesday of next week. Make sure you get your labs done. You've got a week, that's it, no more. Because uh, they're not gonna, not gonna allow us on campus uh, after next Wednesday.